Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Sarah Kennedy. Welcome, Sarah. Um, those of you who know our show know that Grace Under Pressure focuses on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment, compassion. And when you do it as a leader, it means bringing people together for common cause and mobilizing them for positive action. And Sarah Kennedy knows all about that because she leads herself as well as her clients, and she's a much in demand uh, author consultant. So, welcome, Sarah Kennedy. So, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Great. Um, let me tell you, uh, folks, all about you. Uh, Sarah has a unique gift for. Uh, connecting and communicating with her audience. She, she is a national speakers uh, award-winning speaker, which is pretty special, folks. So uh, she's good stuff. Her, her career spends um, spans about a couple of decades, which I think she's lying to me because I don't. <laughs> she hasn't been in business for twenty years because she's only been out of college a few years. <laughs> so anyway, she is. Uh, also, and this is of interest to LI uh, viewers, uh, she's an instructor in the LinkedIn Learning, which is a quite prestigious thing to do, and her course is very popular. And she's been featured in a number of publications like Forbes, Entrepreneur, Wall Street Journal, and Leadership Wire, Wired. She's got a couple of books, and her newer one is Leadership Unchained, and we're going to talk all about it. Sarah, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. Love to be here and I'm excited about our conversation. Great. You know, before we jump in, I um let's what have you learned about yourself and what it takes to lead in times of a crisis or to keep it together? So. Yeah. Uh you know, the obvious one is patience. Um, and I think I've also when you get discovered that, can you teach me, Sarah? <laughs> yeah, really. Right. Um, yeah, I mean. Patience. The other thing I've learned is that I I can't hold on too tightly to my plans. Um, I'm somebody who likes to do things in advance. I'm very methodical. I like to be organized. And you know, let's all face it. Uh, 2020, uh, we had to let go of those plans and we had to pivot and we had to be very responsive in the moment. Um, and so. You know, for me in particular, that was hard to do. Great. One of the things I've talked to many of our guests about um, is resilience. And I know that you focus on this topic too today. So what are you, what lessons on resilience either for yourself or that you see in clients that you work with? So, Yeah, well, I mean, I do a little bit of talking on resilience when I'm working with leaders. And, you know, the one thing I always say is, you know, why is it that if you take two people who have similar pressure, right? They have, you know, maybe similar work pressures and even personal pressures, yet one seems to be handling it well and the other isn't. Um, why do you think that is? And I think that's because um, a couple of things. I think some people are good at not ruminating, right? Not constantly over and over in their head, worrying and repeating and awfulizing things. Um, Awfulizing, I like that. <laughs> yeah, they're they they're better at doing a little bit of it, but then stepping away and then moving towards action. The other thing that I think helps is getting perspective or looking at things in the broader context. And I would say that I think the biggest benefit or way to combat resilience is to be open to you know, sharing your struggles and your stress with others who are in your situation, because guess what? If you can't put perspective, give yourself perspective, they are very good at helping you put structure around your thinking and helping you put things in perspective. Um, and I think that, that that is really something I've learned this week. There's too many people that are trying to go it alone. And that's easy to do in a work from home environment. And so I am advising leaders and people, you know, even at the end of a day, reach out to a trusted colleague or friend and just download your day with them. Even if it's, you know, hey, I just made this decision and I know we have a decision tree. I don't remember if I use that decision tree correctly. Check me on this, right? 
we just need that more, I think, today than ever before. What a good practical advice. And I, um, I've i spoken to a lot of folks on this show about resilience, some of whom are in our military and special forces, both here in the United Kingdom, and uh, may emphasize that, le- uh, that resilience can be taught. And what you've provided, uh, Sarah, is another angle into it, which is a kind of a self-teaching, but with others. And I like the idea of the brief, doing your own brief back, but also verbalizing it with others. And that's so, so constructive. So. Yeah, it's it's uh, it helps whether it's a you know in your personal life and it absolutely helps in your professional life and I don't think we do it enough. No, great. Um, one of the, your area of excellence um, is the field is the idea of presence and something that I've worked in a little bit too. Yeah. So has your notion of presence evolved in our year of isolation, if we will call it that? So. You know, that's an interesting question because that's why I asked it because yeah, I'm an I, interesting person. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it hasn't necessarily evolved. Here's what I think the difference is. I think now people's definition and understanding of presence is going to evolve as a result of the pandemic. And I'll tell you why. Because um, I've heard some people say things like, oh, yeah, well, the fact that we're virtual is now going to level the playing field, right? Mm-hmm. Now yeah. everybody is going to have limited exposure, right? Now, to me, that means that person has a very limited scope of what they think presence and the, the value of presence can be, which is it is the way somebody shows up literally their, their dress, their demeanor, their charisma. Um, and I have always seen presence as much more than that, right? It's the person who can put others at ease, regardless of their education level, their role, or even their own confidence level, right? It's the person who can um, accept a an award or a, an attaboy in a meeting because of a project that was done on time and under budget, but they share the credit with others, right? Um, it's the person who can be transparent and open in their communication with their teams and with their, you know, with others. Um, to me, it is presence is multidimensional, and you know this, John, more than anybody, because it's the same stuff you talk about. Well, I think you're you're more expert in me, and I love the way you dimensionalize this and beyond the communications, beyond the appearance. Um, and I, I've always thought I use the term leadership presence, and I know you do, and I define it as uh, earned authority, if you will, because you earn it through. Yes, your words, but more importantly, your example. Um, A colleague of ours, Ron Carucci, talks about presence as enabling people to feel it. And I think that's how you dimensionalize it in so many different ways of making people, connecting with them. And um, that's a powerful thought. So So does electronic media, video chat, as you and I are doing now, is that a plus or a negative or neutral? So I think it's probably a neutral. you know, for some people might find it a negative because they feel like, oh my gosh, I'm on camera. But I, I think it's a neutral. Great. You know, it's interesting. You talked about the great leveling. A colleague of ours, uh, Cynthia Burnham, who had written about, you know, uh, she's writing about charisma, but also presence, said that the advantage of um, an advantage of our Zoom, our Zoom culture, if you will, is everyone is the same size. <laughs> so that's a a a, a, a a literal leveling, leveling yes. too. But I think it's people can see through if you're the real deal or not. Do you believe that, Sarah? So. I do believe that. I absolutely do believe that. They can smell it out. They can uh, they can see it. You name it. Um, they know Great. when you're not authentic. Right. Now let's delve into leadership unchained, if you will, because it has relevance today. So, um, the, uh, before we dive into the concepts, what inspired you to write this book, uh, Sarah? Yeah, well, like you, John, I, I am hearing from working with leaders every day who, you know, even before the pandemic were, were just exhausted. And they were trying to keep pace with 
the challenges, with the uncertainty, using all the classic success principles. They were doing more, working longer hours, staying more tethered to their to their smart devices, and that just didn't seem to be working. And it's interesting you say this. The first thing you said was before the pandemic. I'm yeah. not old enough to remember when that was, but seriously, we. I mean, we're, we're all feeling tired and fatigued. This, but this issue is not is not just pandemic. Um, imposed, we were a lot, their burnout was very, and stress and burnout were with us, especially for the high achievers. Would you not agree, sir? I, I absolutely, um, I, I saw it every day. Yeah, that's great. So, um, so you provide some solutions and some of them are counterintuitive. So why are you upsetting the apple cart? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I put myself in the mix with these leaders, right? And I begin to notice that some of the things that worked for me and that even I was rewarded for as a leader were no longer working. And so that told me something's got to change and we've got to do things differently um, just to keep pace uh, with, with today. I think we've lost John. Who is no, the host. I took myself oh, off the stream because I smudged my glasses. It oh. only happens when it's live. Oh, I never course. do it any other time. Yeah, so. no, of course not. <laughs> so, but okay. So, was your window into this challenge yourself then, Sarah? Was that what happened? Um, actually, interesting. It was a combination. It was a combination of things that I reflected on that I did when I was in corporate and I realized, wow, that wouldn't work today. Um, example, I was extremely risk averse. And as a leader, I did not allow my team to take any chances. And that is a very regrettable uh, practice that I had. Granted, I was in a very highly regulated industry. I was in insurance, yeah. no excuse. Um, it, it was something that, you know, you don't fail, for example. You don't fail forward like you do today. You don't honor and reward people who try things on. Um, the other is, it came from me. I'll stop there for a second because yeah. we, um, we, that's something that we we talk about as consultants of, you know, create an environment where you can take risks and you are coming before us and saying, I never took risks and I prevented my people from doing it. So wasn't that in itself risky, Sarah? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, looking back, absolutely. But I was marching to the tune of what the culture was. Um, and I was also protecting, right, my own reputation um, by not letting there be any mistakes. And, and it was just, it was not productive and I wasn't going to get the best from my people uh, necessarily or the most creative ideas. You know, were we in lockstep with what we needed to do? Absolutely. Um, but were we innovating? Um, I'm not so sure. Right. Well, what a leap you have made because you went from a somewhat regulated industry insurance into a wholly unregulated, <laughs> crazy upside down world of yeah. consulting. Are you out of your mind or were right. you out of your mind? So how did that work for you, sir? Obviously you're very successful, but how did you adapt from being a non-risker to jumping off the high dive? So. Yeah, it was a lot of fits and starts. Um, and it took, it, it took a lot of commitment. Um, and I had to let go of any ego that was involved. You know, I had ego done very, in what way? A fear of failure or what, um, was in what way? So. You know, I had done very well in corporate. I had reached before I exited, I was a VP of account services. And so I was used to being able to be at the table with decision makers and be in meetings. And, and, you know, suddenly I found myself, um, you know, at a, at a dinner party or somewhere and they say, well, what do you do? And it, you know, what we do is very hard to describe if we are doing leadership consulting or if we're training leaders or doing keynotes or doing executive coaching, you know, people just kind of went, Hmm, 
<laughs> now, why can't companies do that for themselves? Right? You know, and so. Good. Um, <laughs> Very good. Very yeah. good. I love that. That's a good one. So. Yeah. So it, it was just a little bit of a, you know, the transformation. Um, and it took a while. And let's face it. As I became more successful, I became more confident and, and less uh, unsure about my track and about how I expressed what it is that I did and the value that I delivered. Um, right. and I got better at that. So let's delve into some of these strategies, which you okay. identify as counterintuitive. Enlighten us. Well, the first one that I talk about is one that is the hardest for me uh, to defy, so to speak, and that is our obsession with the bias for action. Ah. Yes. Um, so I like to think of myself as a get or done type of person. And I had that type of approach while I was in corporate. I was rewarded for it. Uh, I was brought up sort of in that culture. My father had spent some time in the military and, and you can imagine that's key in the military. Right. But here's the thing. I was beginning to see in myself and in the leaders that I coached that that bias for action could actually get in the way. So for example, um, you know, in this day and age where we are inundated with data, we have no buffer between our meetings, especially now on Zoom. We are consuming massive amounts of information. And so we are going and making decisions and going and making decisions. And I'm saying to people that there's no way you could get your arms around all of the information that's coming to us. How do you separate the signal from the noise? How do you make connections that we're supposed to be making that we missed in the moment and in the haste of rushing? How are we supposed to prioritize what's going to most move ourselves and our teams forward if we are in the constant bias for action? So I tell people that they need to plan for strategic pauses, whether it's every day or every week. I like to call them mental time ins. And the reason I, I say that is because people jump to this idea of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. I'm not against mindfulness. I think it's a great thing, but that's not what I'm talking about here. These strategic pauses will allow you to do all those things, to take everything you've seen, read, and heard in a day or a week and let them percolate so that you can begin to see things that you didn't see in the moment, right? Right. I like it. I, I've always taught um, reflection to clients yes. I've worked with, and I've learned it from executives. And so you're saying engineer it into a daily practice? So. You know, what's interesting is before the pandemic, I would say once a week, right? I have now been suggesting to leaders that they do it at the end of their day. And that's because we have less buffer time between meetings now than we ever did before. Okay. And what yeah. happened? So, what do you, so uh, if I if I'm working with you, Sarah, and you're my coach, and I you talk about this time in, what should I be doing or not doing? So, yeah. So, first of all, let me just say that mental time in can can look different. I mean, it could be at your typical workplace. I personally like to get out of my typical workplace because I think that makes me a little more creative and I might see things with a different uh, lens. Mm -hmm. um, literally, sometimes I'll go to my garage. For me, on a daily basis, sometimes my strategic pause is my walk. I used to do it in the morning and I purposely have shifted to doing it late in the afternoon so that while I'm walking, I can think about everything that I heard in meetings, match it with things that I've read or decisions I need to make and let things start to fall into place. There's something about the moving and the thinking that really helps me. Um, yeah, you're doing a lot when you are taking these pauses, it, you know, literally spreading out your notes from the week, whether you've taken some notes, um, any articles you've put aside that you think have any relationship to something you're trying to achieve. Um, the other thing I tell people, if nothing else, your strategic pause, use that time to pick up the phone and call a colleague and have them help you 
work through some things that you are struggling with or that you want a different perspective on in terms of a solution or a challenge. So this is an an interesting point. And I know why now why you differentiate it between the mindfulness in that your strategic pause is an activity, a, a a core, a collection of thoughts, ideas, or even a conversation. So yes, that's interesting. Great. Okay. So, so what, that's a powerful one. Uh, and I don't think it costs anything to do, does it? <laughs> no, yeah. no. That's great. So now how about another strategy, counterintuitive strategy that you might suggest? So. Well, you know, I've been, I've, I've mentioned this twice, right? That, that we are uh, inundated with data and we love data. In fact, the more data that we get, the more we want, right? Um, and is, that, is that really true? I mean, uh, in the sense that because the, the corollary to that is I'm drowning in yes, data. In data. Okay. So why do you differentiate that, Sarah? So. Well, I the reason I what I'm going to say that's counterintuitive about data is that while we should value it, we should not let it dictate all of our decisions. Right. I feel like we've over indexed on the value we've placed on data. And so what I'm saying is we need to balance hard data with soft intelligence. And John, you know that this is a term that was used or is used by behavioral scientists to to reflect the idea that we need the human insights behind the data. So, you know, companies use net promoter scores, they use customer surveys, They use all kinds of data to track how they're doing and or what the customer wants and needs. But really, in order to know where to really move forward, we've got to know what people, why they rated us the way they did. If they gave us an eight, why? So we can do more of it. If they gave us a three, why? So we can stop doing it. If they're going to recommend us why would they recommend us, right? Right. Um, You know, not to mention there's danger in data, right? Because we automatically are wired to believe that data and facts don't lie. And you know, that's not true, right? Because it depends on where those facts come from. Who collected it? What was the methodology that was used? Did somebody with lived experience help generate the questions that you put together to collect the data, right? There's so much there. And so, yes, it's counterintuitive because I work with a lot of companies whose DNA is about data. And so I stand up before them and say, hold on. And that to them is just, uh, it's counterintuitive. No, and it's great because what you're doing is challenging assumptions. Uh, and. Right. And also, uh, um, and I think why we like data, I think you can postulate a couple of different ways. There's comfort in data yes, uh, in two ways. Well, at least this is what the data says, uh, not checking its validity or not questioning its validity. But the other thing is it's a stalling technique, is it not? So I'm going to make a decision, but I just want this one more data point to come in or two more. Right. Do you encounter that, Sarah? So I do. And what's interesting is I think this last year, more than any, challenged people to make decisions without all the data. Right. I mean, never was there a time where we were forced to take action when we didn't have all the information. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's the 80-20 rule or the Marines have the 70 percent and 20 and, and it's even 50-50 at times. So right. and because to decide is not to decide, um, it's not being flippant about it, but you right. have to go with what you go depending on what the stakes are. So that's right. Um, so and but then then that gets into the bias for action. But with your caveat, if I will <laughs> say, yes. think first. So yes. um, there's another thing you talk about because you are um, I'll call you a rebel, an uh, apple cart uh, upsetter. Um, and you had alluded to this at the beginning of our conversation. You talked about um um habits or practices that leaders were taught and do and 
are no longer valid. So can you, do you have an example of that, Sarah? So. Yeah, well, and I'd like to clarify, I, I, it's not that I think they're no longer valid. I think it's a matter of knowing when to defy conventional thinking and when to use it, right? Um, so I don't, you know, all of these things that we've mentioned, the, the, the data, the bias for action, um, the other one, for example, is, is a chapter in my book, I talk about, you know, benchmarking and how we, you know, in some cases have done uh, a little too much. We've relied too much on benchmarking. Used to be, I used to be so proud as a leader when I was able to go out and benchmark other companies and bring back best practices. But what I'm seeing is that best practices are going stale faster. And so, you know, even within the company, it's something that we may have adopted because it was a best practice in our industry. But are we questioning those quickly enough these days? And rather than, 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 than going out and doing best practice research, why don't we zig while everyone else is zagging type of thing? Great. Why don't we do reverse, uh, you know, best practices or reverse benchmarking? Now I want to throw a question that gets to the old Sarah. So put your old okay. Sarah hat on. Okay. What do you say to someone who says, Sarah, I like what you're saying. I like the counterintuitive, but I don't know if my organization is ready. Or And what they're really saying is, I don't know that I'm ready. So what do you say to them, Sarah? Yeah. I, you know, it, it's like a borrowing from Dr. Phil. Well, <laughs> I'd say, is what you're doing now working for you? Okay. Right, because my guess is that they're trying to keep pace by working harder, longer, and being more tethered, and I don't think it's working. Okay. So that's how I would respond. I, I don't know that they could afford not to try on some of these practices. Good thought. So um, unfortunately, we are racing toward the end of our allotted time, and I ask every guest a story of grace. And do you have one that you would like to share, Sarah? So. You know, I, that is a great question. And what comes to mind for me is not one particular story, although I have benefited from grace in my life over the years, but it makes me think of last year in total. And I'll tell you why, because as I was trying to let go of perfectly laid plans and try on new things that I know my clients needed in the moment, I was extended such grace by you know uh, dogs barking in the background maybe initially or the the FedEx ringing the doorbell or me struggling to put people out in breakout rooms and where I meant to pair them off I put twenty in two different rooms instead of two. Oh, in that's a career room. ender right there. So. Right, right. But but my point is, over and over my clients extended me grace and. Over and over, I feel I've had the opportunity to extend grace. And the simplest example is I can tell you, I don't know about your area, John, but here in Austin, even though our restaurants have been open for a while, we are struggling to hire people in these businesses. Mm -hmm. So when we go and we, we go to an establishment to eat out, much of the time the service is not up to par, but it's not the fault of the individual. Sure. They, I can see them handling twice the number of tables. The kitchen staff is probably low. So we've had the opportunity to also extend grace over and over again this past year. Uh, and of course, grace to our healthcare workers, right? Um, yeah. so, so to me, there wasn't one story, but maybe one period of time, 2020 and now that I think um, grace has been extended, um, the opportunity has been there Threefold. You expressed it very well. And, you know, the, the conversations I've had, sometimes great people describe grace as a transactional thing. Sometimes that's a transformative thing. Sure. You, in a way, call it a kind of process from which you've been benefited and you in turn have given it. So that's really whatever works. And it's a kind of intended con. Um, kindness toward others is compassion. It's consideration. Sure. Uh, those showed people showed it to you and you in turn are, uh, walking the talk that others have shown you. So it's a great, great story. So thank you. So Sarah, um, how can people find you? 
Sure. They can find me right here on LinkedIn, of course, and they can find me on my website, uh, sarahcanaday.com. There's no H on Sarah, and it's Canada with a Y at the end, Canada. Uh, they can find me on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, any any of those handles will do. Um, Sarah, we will put your website in the notes. Excellent. So people will have it. And the name of the book is Leadership Unchained. Un, excuse me. Leadership Unchained. So, yes. um, Sarah, thank you for sharing your expertise and your time with us. And with that, we will um, go out. I say thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs>